and mathematics at the Victor Dixon High School and to recognize the achievements of students in science and music. I want you to know that my wife and I personally know and, and inspired today's guest speaker in the field of science and music. She is one among three scientists that have been nurtured by my wife and me. I anticipate that, that you will be treated to an appetizing intellectual diet for the next 30 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, Delight yourself in the joy of this intellectual feast. Thanks for your participation and be blessed. Good morning to all. The pleasure is mine to bring you greetings from Northern Caribbean University, our president, Dr. Lincoln Edwards, but more so from Dr. Vivian Quarry, the vice president for academic administration and board chair of the Victor Dixon High School on this staging of the third annual Owen Roberts Lecture Series and Awards. Dr. Quarry is present on vacation and she extends best wishes. I share with you two quotes. The first is a Chinese proverb, and the other from Alvin Toffler, an American writer, futurist, and businessman known for his works discussing modern technologies and regarded as one of the world's outstanding futurists. The Chinese proverb. Do not confine your children to your own learning, for they were born in another time. And from Alvin Toffler, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I find that within these two contexts is juxtaposed your theme, science of the pandemic, using science and technology to face the new normal. And I trust that Dr. John Roberts will do a fantastic job as she intends to bring this very dynamic topic to the table. In a paper commissioned by the National Academy of Education under the theme, the challenges of teaching and learning about science in the 21st century, exploring the abilities and constraints of adolescent learners, Anderman and Sinatra found that some of the complex Issues in the field of science education include the availability of approximate, appropriate textbooks, classroom resources, the preparation and training of science teachers, political and religious opposition to cutting edge science instruction, the need to meet standards and to prepare students for standardized examinations, and the dramatically increasing use of the internet to be carefully positioned as a source of information. And within that now comes COVID-19. This pandemic has caused a dynamic shift in the way we do things today. With no face-to-face -face classes, teaching has moved online and the use of other alternative, motive, and the use of other alternative modalities have been brought to the fore to ensure that the teaching learning process continues. So these are challenging times for educators and students alike. It therefore calls for integrity to be carefully positioned on the front burner. Having integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. With technology use in the classroom increasing, the focus on academic integrity in online environments have never been greater. In the online world, the right thing is called, doing the right thing is called digital citizenship. And digital citizenship is the ability to think critically, behave safely, and participate responsibly in the online world. Into this context, science finds itself. Wow, now we are out of the norm 
and into a new normal. And we trust that this lecture series today will bring to the fore new techniques and strategies that we may use to ensure that the learning process is enhanced. May God's peace and his blessing attend throughout this lecture. And on Dr. Quarry's behalf, I wish success and do have a wonderful experience. Greetings from Academic Administration. Thank you so much to our representative of our board chairman. We are now going to the special item from one of our STEM students, who is Joshe Smith, a fifth form student of Three Badly. Hello, everyone. Today I'll be playing Fur Loose by Beethoven. How wonderful, how wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Joshe Smith, who just did her musical piece. So we have heard our greetings from our patron, Dr. Roberts. We have heard from Dr. Peterkin. And now we're going to hear from another special guest. We are going to invite our principal, Mrs. Orchid Smith, to do the introduction. Thank you so much, Mrs. Morgan. Today, Dr. Joan Roberts is our distinguished Owen Roberts Lecture Series and Awards speaker and presenter. She has a passion for people which is evident in her teaching, mentorship and service. She has a Master of Science in Biomedical Science and received her doctorate in Molecular and Cellular Biology and pathobiology from the Medical University of South Carolina. Over the last 10 years, she has published and presented her work in STEM education, cellular microbiology in oral health, and stem cell regeneration in corneal eye diseases. Dr. Joan Roberts currently works with the Center of, for Education Innovation and learning in the sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles, as a program and community engagement manager. She's also a biology professor at the Los Angeles Trade Technical College. In these roles, she focuses on programming to support faculty and future faculty in equitable and inclusive teaching practices. She further works with a team to develop sustainable model for diversifying and supporting graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, and other working professionals interested in teaching and academic leadership in California. She's also a mentor for undergraduate study, um, students in the sciences and helps to navigate both traditional and non-traditional academic career paths. Dr. Roberts is also an innovator and has led the development of virtual teaching collaboration on science literacy 
<clears throat> sorry, with historically black college and university partner institutions in the United States. She's an invited lecturer and has earned distinguished academic and professional honors, including second place Perry Haluska a Music Research Day Oral Competition, American Association and Dental Research Hatton Award finalist, third place James B. Edwards College of Dental Medicine Scholars Day Oral Competition, scholarship for redox biology training at Karolinska Institute at Stockholm, Sweden, second place in Synergy Research Day Oral Competition, University of Florida, and outstanding undergraduate thesis award, Florida Atlantic University. She also has a long profile of select leadership service, including learning environment task force graduate school programs at UCLA and UCLA Postdoc Advisory Council. Recently, Dr. Joan Roberts um, published, and as recent as March 2021, so very relevant, she published a teaching tool for integrating metacognitive regulation in online classroom using student development learning plans. She is also a peer peer-reviewed author and has um, published several times. One of her favorite quotes by an activist and author, James Baldwin, is that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. She says it reminds and encourages her to maintain a posture of growth and boldness. The world does not improve, technology does not advance, and relationships do not heal if we do not critically examine our past and our present and have the courage to act. Today, we have as our guest speaker, the daughter of our patron, Dr. Roberts, and evidently she is carving out a distinct path of excellence for herself in keeping with her family tradition. Although busy, she finds time to be music director at her Seventh-day Adventist church. And just before we welcome her with open arms and ask her to motivate and inspire the students of the Victor Dixon High School, we will welcome Joel and Jonathan Wright with a musical rendition. Thereafter, we will hear from Dr. Joanne Roberts, and we welcome her warmly. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for that warm introduction, um, Mrs. Smith. And I'm going to go ahead. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so, um, you know, just uh, Mrs. Smith talked about my background um, in STEM and in science, um, where I uh, completed my degrees and ended up doing cellular microbiology research, um, did eye research for some time. And then now what I'm doing is research and investigation into how to make classrooms more equitable and more inclusive in STEM. And I share this for two reasons. Um, one, your career and your life and your passions are an ever evolving process. And as you grow, the more exposure you have, I wanna encourage you in your pursuit of your goals and as they involve. And the second reason is that um, scientists and teachers um, have lives beyond the classroom and as a model that you don't have to just be one thing. So in addition, I am a um, published musician and songwriter. Um, in addition to my STEM pursuits. And so how um, it's okay to have more than one thing and how you pursue what your um, passions are and what you are interested in is important. And I'm hopeful that you'll leave this talk with um, some tools that will help you do that. So what I'm gonna talk today about um, mainly is about metacognition and its importance in the STEM classroom. And STEM is not just subject matter, but it's a way of thinking. So it's a critical way of questioning, um, exploring, and engaging with the world, uh, learning how to discover and test those questions for new discovery and improvement of current ones to solve larger problems. Technology, uh, science, and knowledge even is, is growing at an exponential rate. So to be part of this world is to ensure that you have the tools to thrive in it. And this is regardless if you um, are actually going into a STEM career or not. This, this way of thinking in STEM, um, of integrating and uh, applying knowledge to solve the challenges that society and countries and people face is invaluable for anyone. So research shows that children who study STEM also develop a variety of skills that are essential for success. So critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, um, communication, innovation, um, all of those are important even beyond uh, STEM uh, careers. So the National Research Council in the United States made this statement, which I thought was um, a really good place to start regarding the connection between science and technology. And so the central, the statement says, the central distinguishing characteristic between science and technology is a difference in goal. The goal of science is to understand the natural world. And the goal of technology is to make modifications in the world to meet human needs. So technology and science are closely related a single problem often has both scientific and technological aspects. So the need to answer questions in the natural world essentially drives the development of technological products. And in the same way, technological needs um, can drive scientific research. And I think a good example of this, in my opinion, um, is the evolution and, and need of prosthetics. So 
There are many different reasons why an individual might lose a limb due to health or an accident, or um, individuals can be born with conditions or abnormalities that would result in the loss of a limb as well. But regardless of the reason, someone or some people saw this as a problem and, and said, how do we help with, with balance and the maybe crutches or a cane, something to help distribute weight? And then ultimately, how can we make that better? So there was um, wooden prosthetics. And then we jump ahead um, after many revisions and going back and forth in the scientific process, understanding how the body works, how movement works, how the skeletal muscular system work together, understanding these things, understanding the neuromuscular junction. Um, then we ultimately now have um, mind controlled prosthetic arms. And this is essentially um, an arm that can link with the neuroanatomy of a person. And so for the first time, people with arm amputations can experience sensations of touch in a mind-controlled armed prosthesis um, in a way that they use it in everyday life. And there was actually a study, um, a research study on three Swedish patients who have this and have lived for several years with this new technology, which is one of the world's most integrated interfaces between human and machine. And ultimately what scientists are trying to do is unlock the potential for the regeneration of limbs to stimulate an arm to just grow back. Um, and these advancements would not be possible without the relationship between science and technology that cycles between understanding of science and modification application of technology. So what does this have to do with the online classroom? Well, we want to view it as an opportunity. So the goal of an instructor or teacher is to facilitate uh, the learning environment um, for the students. And the student's goal should be to uh, leverage this learning environment for the highest possible achievement that they can imagine and, and then also add to it. So adding to it from um, personal experience by uh, asking questions and, and pushing on the boundaries of knowledge. Um, it's also an opportunity to um, keep those conversations alive, uh, even outside of the classroom, um, and an opportunity for students to engage in a variety of ways and, and even instant feedback. Um, research also suggests that um, online platforms uh, have a big potential to expand access to quality STEM education worldwide. And students actually learn just as much in online STEM co um, courses as they do in traditional classroom settings, um, according to a first of its kind study um, since the pandemic ensued. So online or, um, learning is also an opportunity to uh, shift from a more passive approach to learning to a more active and student-centered approach where the classrooms, time and resources and other factors may play a role in what format is possible, the online format really up, opens up doors for more classroom engagement. And so if you look at these images here, um, if you think about traditional or instructor-centered um, uh, education systems where there's um, a lot of lecturing and being taught um, at the non-traditional or student-centered or active approach has more collaboration and discussion um, and student engagement. So um, how can uh, students better position themselves to learn in online STEM classes through metacognition is one of the first things that I'm gonna talk about um, today. And then the role of technology in STEM briefly, and then also how teachers and students alike can use the technology to facilitate um, active learning online. So metacognition by definition is an awareness of one's own thinking. Um, first you have um, this thing like, I know what I'm thinking, thinking processes, knowing what you know. And this is terms metacognitive knowledge. So you see the little thought bubbles um, above the person, the cartoon person. Um, it might say like, I'm noticing, or I noticed that uh, I get easily distracted while studying 
or uh, I'm feeling overwhelmed by the amount of subject material. So there's this first aspect um, of metacognition that you know what you know. Um, this self-reflection um, or uh, of knowing what you're thinking um, is a good step and is a good first step, but a question that sometimes goes unanswered is what do I do with this thinking? Or um, now that I know what I know about myself, how do I go about changing it? So I'm feeling overwhelmed by this particular subject material. What do I do now? So the other aspect of metacognition um, is the activities we get, engage in to facilitate our learning. We call metacognitive regulation. Um, a better understanding of of metacognitive regulation actually benefits students by increasing self-efficacy, which is essentially the confidence in knowing that I can achieve um, what I've set out to achieve. I can achieve in this particular subject area. Um, also promotes academic, academic achievement and um, positive attitudes overall and student motiva um, motivation in STEM. So what does metacognition look like? Um, there's planning. Um, so considering how to approach the task, actually assessing the task, um, evaluating its strengths and, and weaknesses in the monitoring phase, um, and then um, applying strategies and reflecting and adapting on it in this evaluation phase. And I actually incorporate this into my own classroom um, through a metacognitive exercise um, throughout the course of, of a semester. Um, and allows the students to practice uh, this, this metacognition when they're learning human biology, which is the subject that I teach. So I'm gonna share with you um, a way to engage in this with online learning and STEM in particular. So what I do is I have um, students develop a learning plan for my class and I encourage them to do it for their other classes as well. Um, and the first step is to reflect and identify. And so what this means is thinking about what are your goals for the next exam or for the overall course? And what are your specific learning challenges or barriers that could arise as you're trying to uh, meet this goal? And what are ways that you can overcome or meet this challenge to still allow for your success? So here are a few examples from um, students in my class um, that are being very honest with themselves about what is keeping them from reaching their goals. And this doesn't mean that these are necessarily bad things, but these were things that needed to adjust in their lives specifically and needed to prioritize um, in order to be more successful in their classes. So um, one student mentioned social media and video games and decided that their strategy would be to turn the phone off, put it aside when they're studying and make sure that their focus is on studying only. Um, in addition, using video games as this reward system where they hit their video games for them, themselves for the week and only after their um, study assignments were done could they play video games. Um, student two um, talked about having to balance um, their time with their family. And so their solutions that they came up with was um, you know, staying in their room um, with music on, quiet music or uh, that would help them study or talking to um, their parents about their study habits and when they need to study or waking up earlier for quiet time. And then another student about staying focused and finding enough time as well, um, played music or um, reading in their odd spare time as well. And again, these were solutions that they came up with, but this is an iterative process, which basically means it goes in a cycle. So they find a solution and then they try it and then they determine if that's actually working for them. And then they go back to the drawing board and adjust. So the next thing that they did um, was to create now a study plan. So keeping those things in mind, their goals, their challenges, and even the types of study strategies they have, they create this um, time sheet um, that times out when will they study in relation to the rest of their day um, and all the other responsibilities that um, they may hold. After they've timed it out, what are they going to um, uh, actually a study in these planned study sessions. So if I'm studying from two to four on Monday, what do I actually plan to do during that time of studying? 
So um, what these uh, study sessions look like, um, this is a really good book by Sandra uh, McGuire called Teach Yourself How to Learn, which I also recommend for my students um, to read. And it's all about metacognition and how to really um, apply this to, um, to their learning. And so it talks about a study cycle and intense study sessions. So a very small um, window of study time, setting a goal, um, maybe it's an hour study time or two, setting a goal of what exactly they're going to study, studying with that focus, and then also including a reward at the end of that study period. In addition to these intense study sessions, how are you engaging during the class? Prior to class, are you reading the chapters? Are you doing the pre-assignments, if there are any? Are you attending and paying attention in class, asking questions, taking good notes? Are you reviewing, reviewing the information within 24 hours of actually getting the information in class? And how are you um, having good repetition of your study time? And so assessing this and having this reflection period to see if we need to go and adjust um, how we're studying. In addition to that, some effective study tips. Um, so planning this schedule balanced um, activities, but also leaving unscheduled time for flexibility because life does happen um, in a nutshell. And so leaving that time for adjustments if necessary. Um, planning enough time for studying each part of the content. So sometimes there are areas that are more familiar and ensuring that you're um, putting the time in um, where it needs to be. Um, studying at a set time in a consistent place. So um, there's something good about repetition and about um, this is the place where I study. So every time I'm here, I study. So for example, your bed is where you sleep. So when you get in bed, your body knows it, it adjusts to now it's time to sleep. I'm in a sleep um, place mentally. In the same way, if you have a designated space that you always study, your mind goes into a mindset of I'm ready to study. Um, there's also studying as soon as after your class is possible because there is um, not just the freshness of the information, but there is also um, a sort of prior knowledge. So if you went into class and didn't know anything about a particular subject, now you have prior knowledge to base um, your studying on because you just learned it. So as soon as possible after class, reviewing that information and you can also get um, questions out of that time. Um, utilizing odd hours. So bus time, walking time, um, just odd times of the day that um, would necessarily be thought of study time can be used if you have um, a busier schedule. Um, and also limiting it to no more than two hours on any one subject at a time so that the study time can be spread out and that increases uh, longer learning or long-term learning. And then also review, um, review, recite, recite. And this kind of example is just reading over a book is not going to be effective studying. Um, reciting, being able to teach something back, self-quizzing, being able to recall it um, without looking at um, sort of a memory jogger is, is how you want to make sure that some information is going to stick. So this last step in the process is that the students get feedback from me as their instructor, but also reflect themselves. Uh, do they meet their goal after the first exam? What might need to change or modify in their plan? And then during this modification process, um, it's really important to have what we call a growth mindset. So this means when reflecting on strategies that didn't work um, or perhaps uh, not meeting the goal that you have initially set, um, intentionally shifting your thinking from, I can't do this um, in a fixed mindset to I can try something different or I can try a different strategy um, from I didn't do this well, um, you know, so I can try a different way next time or um, this work is good, um, this work is good enough, I can just turn this in to is this really my best work and, and pushing ourselves to be, um, to be better. And then this is too hard versus this may take some time and effort, but I can still do this. Uh, to, so to summarize this metacognitive approach, um, so before, Think about existing strategies and strengths and set goals. Um, what's currently working for you? Have you done something like this before? What do you want to achieve? 
The during is the sort of the trial and error period. So is this strategy working for me? Can I change anything? Am I meeting my goals? Um, and then after, what worked well? Um, do I need to um, improve anything or alter it? How can I apply this to different uh, areas or subject matter? Um, so thinking about if this method is useful, um, just some uh, comments from my students who seem to think so. Uh, in open-ended feedback they've given, I will just highlight a couple on the screen. Um, so here at the Arrow, um, it allowed me to become more organized in terms of studying and submitting work. It made the classes seem easy and clear. So my attitude towards my potential success is positive. Um, it wasn't easy at first, but with time I got motivated and now I have less stress studying. It actually helped improve my grades in this class and my other classes. And there are other comments um, as well. And in addition, survey data I collected showed a positive shift in students' beliefs that they have the skills to succeed in online courses in STEM when comparing pre-thoughts um, pre to doing this activity, um, to post this activity, how, they're, um, how their thinking changed. Um, and I encourage uh, instructors to elicit feedback from your students on your instruction. Um, the metacognitive journey in the classroom is equally as important for the instructor as it is for the student. And it helps us as educators to uh, make the classroom more student focused than instructor focused. And um, I mentioned this before, but what exactly do I mean by this is that um, previously there was a centralized mode of teaching where the assessment of outcomes were at the end of what we did as teachers. So first we write up our syllabus or what our lesson plan, um, prepare our content, write exams based on that content and then assess the student outcomes. And a student-centered approach is really um, going backwards. So it starts with student outcomes. What do you really want the students to learn? And then um, moving backwards to how will I know that my student has achieved the learning outcome I've desired? Um, and then planning learning um, activities and engagement that aligns with the learning outcomes and the evidence of achievement. Uh, so technology has an important role in this student-centered process of teaching and in ways students engage. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but two major ways that technology is used in STEM education um, is that it's used as an educational or uh, instructional technology. Um, but it's also used um, as a tool that's used by practitioners, so individuals with careers in STEM. And I'll briefly talk about both, but let's start with technology as education, as an educational tool. And according to research in cognitive science, there are three fundamentals of learning. So individuals learn, um, build on um, prior knowledge. And so building on what they already know or have been exposed to. Then the learning is promoted by uh, constant feedback. So a formative assessment, having um, low points, but um, prior to big stakes exams that count for most of the grade, um, having these low stakes um, opportunities for students to know how they're doing um, and to understand if they actually understand the content, and that's both for student and instructors. And then active learning, which is um, better retained than passive learning, which I briefly mentioned at the beginning. Um, so active learning, simply put, is a way to engage students in the process of learning through activities, discussion, and class, as opposed to passively listening to an expert. And it emphasizes higher order thinking. And what I mean by higher order thinking is um, not just remembering and understand according to Bloom's taxonomy, um, a sort of a separation of, of, of how we learn, but also, um, analyzing data, applying it to a new scenarios and problems, um, evaluating why something is reliable or true, and ultimately creating something new from the information that you have. And that's exactly what we described um, occurred in our prosthetics example earlier was direct application of higher order thinking and science. And so for students, even knowing this Bloom taxonomy designation of learning helps you to self-check if you're challenging yourself with higher learning as well in your studies. 
And so just to emphasize the impact of uh, active learning strategies in the classroom, comprehensive research has been done showing that the use of active learning in the classroom increases student performance specifically in STEM. So the data uh, definitely supports the use of this um, in STEM classrooms. So just um, highlighting a few active learning strategies in the online classroom. Um, there's think, pair, share, which basically students um, take a minute to think for themselves about a discussion question or a topic. They pair up and share, um, talk about it together, and then they share out loud in the, in the larger classroom um, some of the answers. And then um, it allows for um, uh, students to learn from each other and for the instructor to be able to intervene if there are any misunderstandings. One at pa minute paper is basically a quick write. It can be at the end of a class. Write down what you learned today, the, the major takeaway, a question that you still have. It's a way for, for instructors to get an idea and a gauge of where there may be gaps in learning at the end of a course or a lesson. Um, group work, collaborative documents, um, uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Polling, um, which has been used a lot, especially now with online learning, um, small group discussions and pre student presentations as well. And there are tools to facilitate this. The most common one known is going to be the um, Zoom polling and annotation. So um, annotating um, directly on the screen, um, uh, doing pa using Padlet, uh, Mentimeter, sorry, one second, um, Google Slides or Docs. Um, these are all uh, tools to facilitate student learning and engagement online. Um, and this is, again, not an exhaustive list. But one of the ones that is my favorite is Padlet. Um, so just showing an example of what this can look like, um, where students can um, put lingering questions, but they're all seeing each other's posts. Um, similarly, um, it could be used as a discussion board. It can also be used for concept mapping. Um, so Padlet has a lot of different uses, but the idea is that students are able to have peer-to-peer -peer learning, discussion and interaction in an online format where they're able to, um, to be able to uh, uh, lean on each other and have a learning community that allows for um, for better growth and engagement in, in the material. Um, there's also Mentimeter, which is a good tool to give students um, engagement and to inform the structure of how the students are progressing. Um, and I always love a good word cloud, which is um, basically the bigger the, the word is, the more times it was used. And um, uh, students seem to like this when I've used it in class. Um, you can say, what did you learn this week in biology? Or you can ask, um, what's the first word that comes to mind when you consider, um, like I teach human biology, so when you consider the reproductive system, what's the first word that comes to mind? And you get a gauge for the knowledge that the students already have and can adjust your, um, your uh, lesson plan accordingly. And can also use it for our surveying as well. So finally, in addition to using technology as an instructional tool, uh, technology um, as tools um, and, and used um, in practices by uh, uh, scientists and mathematicians and engineers, um, it's really important to, to get students to uh, have, have exposure to that. So this resource, is, it's, a, it's a YouTube playlist, but it has a lot of uh, short videos that are actually really really good about how to um, use STEM uh, technology to support STEM learning. Um, so I just wanted to also give this resource to anyone who wanted to look up, look into this more. Um, but it, it gives an idea for students of what does STEM look like in the real world and utilizing um, learning technologies in, in an inquiry-based classroom closely emulates how how scientists work in the real world and, and students can collect and analyze real-time data, much like scientists do. So there are a few online formats I'd like to highlight. Um, there's an online microscope that I like to use for my students um, for biology classes. Um, basically, I'm uh, just showing a, a, a picture here of it where they can um, use course and find focus if they're not in an actual classroom. Um, to adjust the microscope, go through the different objectives and magnifications, learn about what this magnification means, um, how to work with the microscope, and be able to view different kinds of samples. So this is um, a, 
an example of whitefish, um, basically an, an animal cell and being able to look at phases of mitosis in, in this example. Um, there's also LabQuest, which allows students to have um, collaborative data collection and analysis, and also considering project-based fieldwork or community data. And so what I mean by that is that um, there are websites where data from the community is collected and inputted, and that's a way for students to take data that's already out there and analyze it and sort of do a meta-analysis of understanding, okay, so now that we have this data, what are, what are um, applications for this data? What can we also create from this data? And this doesn't, and I, I've shared this because it doesn't have to be something that your instructor necessarily assigns, but if it's something you're interested in, the resources are out there. Um, the project-based field work is something that can still be done online, where a project is assigned that students go outside into the learning environment and, um, or outside into the, um, the outside environment and are able to learn in that environment. So they can collect um, a, a sample or take a picture. Um, for example, we did biodiversity and, and students had to um, go out in nature and take pictures Thank of you, certain Mom. plants and identify. Um, identify different plants um, or um, and identify a natural selection, et cetera. Um, so using these strategies to still allow the students to engage um, with science in, in a very real way um, and also um, with each other uh, and in a collaborative way. So uh, finally, for both instructors and students, we acknowledge that online learning has its challenge and limitations, um, but encouraging students to be self-regulated learners who think about, monitor, and adapt their learning through metacognition, and for teachers to actively seek ways to engage students in and outside of the classroom um, in the conversation about science and becoming a reflective and adaptable instructor. So even if we go back in person, there's definitely value in continuing online hybrid courses and tactfully uh, using online technology to advance STEM learning. Um, so thank you for listening and to the center I work in, um, as well as the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching and Learning at the University of California in Los Angeles. Um, and yes, yeah, so any questions? Um, from anyone I'm happy to take through the chat or um... that would be grateful if they can get the chat going and ask a question and in that way you can engage them sure that we all have been blessed I know the parents were able to get there's the how to help the students to engage themselves to also can process their thoughts in a metacognitive way and teachers of course can enable themselves to engage students in more student-centered learning we all got something from your presentation dr joanne roberts and we thank you heartily you're very welcome we are going, if you are just joining us, we have been engaged in the Owen Roberts Science Lecture Series and Awards. We just got the lecture part of this, this occasion. And we're gonna be going into our awards section. But just before we do so, if you are viewing us on YouTube, we would love for you to like, subscribe and share. In that way, we will have our ratings up as Victor Dixon High School has produced its own YouTube channel. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you again, Dr. Roberts, for allowing us to hear from you and your innovation and what you have shared, everything that you have shared with us. So thank you again. We are going to go into the award section of our program. Here to lead out in this segment are two teachers. We have Ms. Thereen Thomas and we have Mrs. Harriet Foster, who will be doing this segment of the program. Please stay tuned and hope you are blessed. We will at this time 
recognize our students who will be awarded in the areas of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and music. We will first start with our fifth form students. From five Dennis, we have Carisse Drummond. Malik Thompson, Rajani Miller, Anna Earl, Dustin Johnson, LeBron Gordon, Jordan Somers. Adriel Campbell, Carisse Drummond. Congratulations to all our fifth form awardees. And now we are going to have our fourth form awardees. Our first one, Sasha Lee Swaby. Oshana Campbell. Jeshwana Crawford. Andre Francis, Jonathan Wright, Romina Tabanar, Lorian Saki. Dominique Reed, Danica Henry, Reve Edwards, Carlene Daly. Jeshwana Crawford. And now, our third form awardees. Sarika Allen. Azrael Forbes, Lashara Johnson, Romario Tabana, Shalene Allen, Levani Hansen, Krishan Ricketts. Joseph Onoweri, Samuel Narayana, Danito Murray, Daquan Dixon, Dylan Beadle, Kaylee Titus. Jashe Smith, Brianna Sharp, Sarah Beth Burton. Congratulations to our third form awardee. And 
And now our second form award is Romaine Bolt, Odin Walters. Rajunia Hamilton, Kimanda Smith, Roger Miller, Joshua Swaby, Joel Wright, Sarah Earl. Anisia Edwards, Kimoy Nocha, and that is the end of the awardees for a second form. Ms. Thomas. And now our awardees for first Form. Antonio Williams, Zion Thompson, Kamal Roberts, Torrain Lopez, Nathan Clark. Rashida Makala, Takara Bryan, Jamila Biggs, Josh Jones, DeMarco Paul, Nakia Surf, Kail Grant, Makaya Dawkins, Tajua Winter, Najwa Winter, Jetanique Gordon, Alicia Kramer, Rowena Banton. Congratulations to all our first form awardees. We will now turn over to our chairperson, Mrs. Morgan. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas and Mrs. Foster for taking us through that applause. The applause went to all the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth formers who are considered the STEM awardees. And for those who may not be aware, STEM awardees are those who have excelled in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects for the school year 2020 to 2021. So congratulations to all our winners out there. Whether your pictures were on the screen or whether your names were called, we give you all an applaud. You have just attended the third Owen Roberts Lecture Series and Awards. Congratulations for all those who have attended, especially to our STEM honor students. We, when we look at our theme, science of the pandemic, using science and technology to face the new normal, we can be assured that whatever we have learned from Dr. Joan Roberts and what we see in happening in our society, we can learn that science can enable us to be better scientists, whether we are upcoming scientists or whether we are functioning scientists at the moment, we can be all better persons. One thing is sure, the corona pandemic has compelled leaders, policymakers, and everyday people to think carefully about what makes this world healthy and resilient. At the time as this, it has prompted many to rethink how we can address either 
other catastrophes, such as climate change, food insecurities, and social inequalities. One leader said, just as the pandemic sees no borders, digital technology can also transcend national jurisdictions. So we are not confined anywhere. And the coronavirus has taught us that much. We live in a global market. And here we are at Victor Dixon High School celebrating our lecture series and awards. Thank you so much for all those who have come. And to take us out of this segment, we are going to be having a special song from one of our STEM awardees and our first performers, Rashida Makala. Everyone. I hope this song bless your heart. In holy pages, this truth can be found. A promise to stand on when darkness abounds. All the right never loses, and wrongs never win, and grace will always be greater than sin. Grace will always be greater than sin. Calvary has proven it time and again. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, God's grace will always be greater than sin. Broken and bruised from the choices you've made. Sin as a price, and so often we pay. Oh, but Jesus is waiting, new world is in Him. And grace will always be greater than sin. Grace will always be greater than sin. Calvary has proven it time and again. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, God's grace will always be greater than sin. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, God's grace will always be greater than sin. Good morning, everyone. This has been an inspiring ceremony and has encouraged me to keep pushing and striving to make the best of my time here using science and technology to face this new norm in a new era of learning. I would firstly want to thank God for allowing us to see this day to celebrate the accomplishments he had helped us reach. I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Joanne Roberts, for taking time out of your schedule to tell us about how we can be self-regulated learners through metacognition 
to set goals, analyze results, and make adjustments to better our study habits. And for our teachers to use the online resources to engage their students and to plan lessons, students focus. Dr. Owen Roberts, I am sure that as you sat and listened to your daughter, that you beamed with joy as she spoke to us and carried on your legacy in science. So we thank you for being the patron to this annual event that has inspired many of us. I would also like to thank our parents, guardians, teachers, and students for coming out this morning to support all of us. To our chairperson, Mrs. Morgan, thank you for doing such a wonderful job and to the other participants for your contribution to the program. Thank you to our principal, Mrs. Smith, acting vice principal, Mrs. Morgan, and teachers involved for planning and executing this wonderful program. Thank you. And that was our recessional musical rendition. And what a beautiful morning we've had as a precursor to the wonderful day we will have today. And uh, Dr. Joan Roberts, you certainly inspired our students. My own daughter was inspired in real time immediately. And she said, will you share that presentation with us, uh, Dr. Roberts? And I'm sure our teachers and our parents were also inspired. Our fifth form students are at school today. And so they were in face-to-face -face school preparing to write their final exam. So they are going into exams now with also some new information and some new techniques. So we're showing you in real time what is happening at uh, Victor Dixon High School with some of our students right there. Also, I wanted to let our awardees understand and know that they will be receiving special gift certificates courtesy of Dr. Owen Roberts. These gift certificates will be going to our special awardees for the purchase of books educational, inspirational books that will assist you. So he has donated $60,000 towards that venture. Also, there are physical certificates for you to be able to collect at the school. We initiated, we initiated our YouTube channel this um, for this event, thanks to Mr. Blake and also Malik Thompson, one of our fifth form students and awardees an awardee for this morning. And um, we thank all those persons who participated, all our teachers and all our office personnel who assisted us in helping us to have a successful event today. 
So God bless you and thank you so much for your participation as we move into classes for today.